Okay, today we're going to start with a spiritual practice, uh, which is the Eucharist. And I'm going to do it a couple of ways, that is, introduce it a couple of ways, um, from the earliest traditions of, of this Christian ritual. We'll start with uh, St. Paul. So this is very early in the in the history of the church. We have the ritual, and uh, here's a bit of background. Um, in chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, coming before the actual words of institution, the words that are used still today in many churches for introducing the Eucharist. Now in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together it is not for the better, but for the worse. For to begin with, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and to some extent I believe it. Indeed, there have to be factions among you, for only so will it become clear among you who are genuine. When you come together, it is not really to eat the Lord's Supper, for when the time comes to eat, each of you goes ahead with your own supper, and one goes hungry and another becomes drunk. What? Do you not have homes to eat and drink in, or do you show contempt for the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I commend you in this manner? For I have received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he blessed it. Uh, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Hey there. And in the same way, he took the cup also after dinner, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this, and as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and, and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be answerable for the body and blood of the Lord. Examine yourselves, and only then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For all who eat and drink without discerning the body eat and drink judgment upon against themselves. For this reason, many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If you are hungry, eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for your condemnation. So what we find here is that there were some disagreements about how this should be done very early on in the early days of the church. And you pick up some background on the, on the context in which this ceremony was conducted. And it was around a full-blown meal, uh, sometimes called the agape, or unconditional love meal. So it was a communal feast, uh, and then as part of that feast, at the end of it, that's when the ceremony happens. Because it says here, in the same way, he took a cup also after supper. So there's this a meal, and um, it's in the context of a, of a communal meal that this, that this happens. So he's chastising the Corinthians for um, getting wasted at this meal getting carried away, being gluttonous, drunken, and so on. Um, so he wants this, he's suggesting that this be a solemn um, ritual occasion, and uh, that colors uh, this description. But what we see here is that very, very early on in the history of the, in the emergence of the early Christian church, this ceremony had become very much part of uh, the life of the community. 
done in different ways in different uh, communities of the church, and uh, which is why he feels compelled to tell them how to do it. There's already differences uh, in how the ceremony is conducted. Uh, an example of some of those differences is to be found in uh, um, in the uh, Gnostic strand of the early church. And uh, we have the information we have about the Gnostics, a lot of it comes from the winners in the battle about theology. Um, as they say, history is written by the winners. That's certainly true in the case of the early church. Um, so the, the church fathers, quote unquote, the, uh, the early bishops and, and uh, uh, theologians of, of early Christianity, who were identified with the emergence of, of the uh, Catholic Church, and, uh, Orthodox tradition of Christianity, uh, they wrote screeds against the Gnostics and other people they considered heretics. And it's from their screeds and their descriptions of these heresies that we know anything about them, in many cases. Um, so that that's they become a source. So. Uh, Here's, here, this is uh, uh, some background from Irenaeus, who's one of, the, one of the early church fathers. And he's describing um, uh, the ritual life of the Gnostic, one of the Gnostic communities. Uh, and at, at first, at, as I said before, the Gnostic tradition of Christianity, very early, uh, very much part of the church at the very beginning. And uh, uh, there was no orthodoxy to Gnosticism. Right? There are, it took many, many forms. The word Gnostic is a kind of a vague term referring to some of the general commonalities of the strand of Christianity, which we've talked about before. The main idea being that uh, there are kind of levels of knowledge to attain. And, uh, and by going through the rites and rituals, some of which were secret, uh, and being initiated into these mysteries, that's how you attain a higher level of knowledge, deeper spiritual connection with God. Uh, so just to give you a little flavor of the Gnostic environment, which, took, as I say, took many, many forms, uh, this is one, one description of the Gnostic uh, rituals from Irenaeus, who's saying how evil and bad this was. They affirm that it is necessary for those who have attained to perfect knowledge of Gnosis that they be regenerated into the power which is above all. Otherwise, it is impossible to enter into the pleroma, the highest uh, unity with God, because it is this only that leads them down into the depths of the abyss, that is, of the divine first cause. While some celebrated as a baptism, indeed as the spiritual over the merely psychic baptism of the early Jesus, earthly Jesus, others regarded as an anointing rite, which is also performed for the dying. Some of the formulas in this rite, okay, here we are. Um, list here. Yes, here we go. Um, so there, there's uh, one of the features of, of the Gnostic tradition is uh, uh, that there's a lot of involvement of women uh, in the rituals, and that was considered very outrageous. So uh, in the Orthodox, emerging Orthodox tradition. Um, so Irenaeus describes how women were performing the Eucharist and baptisms and other ceremonies of the church. Um, so this is a bit of the context for this passage. And this comes from the um, from the Acts of Thomas, which is one of the Gnostic, uh, one of the Nag Hammadi texts, the Gnostic uh, texts that were discovered uh, in the 
the 20th century. Some of the, these are some of the words of institution that were used in, in some of the uh, Gnostic congregations. Jesus, you make us worthy to partake of the Eucharist of your holy body and blood. Behold, we make bold to approach your Eucharist and call upon your holy name. Come and have fellowship with us. Come, gift of the Most High. Come, perfect compassion. Come, fellowship of the male and female. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, you who know the mysteries of the chosen. Come, you, have, you who have part in all the combats of the noble athlete. Come, treasure of glory. Come, darling of the compassion of the Most High. Come, silence that reveals the great deeds of the whole greatness. Come, you who show forth the hidden things and make the ineffable manifest. Holy dove that bears the twin young. Come, hidden mother. Come, you who manifest in your actions and furnish us with joy and rest for all that are joined with you. Come and partake with us in this Eucharist, which we celebrate in your name. <clears throat> and in the love feast in which we are gathered together at your call. One of the original documents of, uh, of early Christianity. And, it can, and this, the Didache is a great uh, source for getting a window into what early church life was like. Um, so this is uh, uh, the Eucharistic prayer that comes from the Didache. On every Lord's Day, his special day, come together and break bread and give thanks, first confessing your sins so that your sacrifice may be pure. Anyone at variance with his neighbor must not join you until they are reconciled, lest your sacrifice be defiled. For it was, this, it was of this sacrifice that the Lord said, Always and everywhere offer me a pure sacrifice, for I am a great king, says the Lord, and my name is marveled at by the nations. Now about the Eucharist, this is how to give thanks. First, in connection with the cup, we thank you, our Father, for the holy vine of David, your child, which you have revealed through Jesus, your child, to you be glory forever. Then in connection with the peace broken off the loaf, we thank you, our Father, for the life and knowledge which you have revealed through Jesus, your child, to you be glory forever. As this piece of bread was scattered over the hills and then was brought together and made one, so let your church be brought together from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. For yours is the glory and the power through Jesus Christ forever. After you've finished your meal, say grace in this way. We thank you, Holy Father, for your sacred name which you have lodged in our hearts and for the knowledge and faith and immortality which you have revealed through Jesus your child. To you be glory forever. Almighty Master, you have created everything for the sake of your name and have given human beings food and drink to enjoy that they may thank you. But to us you have given spiritual food and drink and eternal life through Jesus, your child. Above all, we thank you that you are mighty. To you be glory forever. Remember, Lord, your church to save it from all evil and make it perfect by your love. Make it holy and gather it together from the four winds into your kingdom which you have made ready for it. For yours is the power and the glory forever. Let grace come and let this world pass away. Hosanna to the Son of David. If anyone is holy, let him come. If not, let him repent. Our Lord, come. And the word would have been Maranatha, Greek. Amen. And it says here, in the, in the case of prophets, however, you should let them give thanks in their own way. So the wandering teachers, the one among the, the different uh, church communities were given that latitude in the ceremony. So, uh, a friend of mine, I think I might have mentioned her, uh, is... Uh, a woman by the name of uh, Rosa Miller. Did I talk about her? She's the bishop of the uh, of the Ecclesia Gnostica Mysteriorum in Palo Alto, the Church of the Gnostic Mysteries. And uh, I've been to her mass 
that she conducts. And it's, it's, uh, it has this Gnostic uh, flavor to it. And she has woven in elements of the very earliest uh, Christian rituals in the Gnostic tradition into the Mass that she performs in, the, in her tradition. And uh, in her words, she says, in her Mass, as she breaks the bread, she says, May your mystery be completed in me. So I break this bread and offer you this cup. And as we take it, let us uh, meditate before we take it on how we can be reconciled in any of our relationships. This was a very powerful theme in the early church that one should not take the sacrament without being reconciled with any relationship that was broken, that the sacrifice was meant to bring people together, scattered to the four corners of the earth, scattered over the hills, to bring pe people together, uh, to bring body and soul together in the bread and in the cup. So, when you're ready, come forward and have a piece of bread, a sip of the fruit of the vine. Pretty high bar. It is. I don't know that at any point in my life I've ever felt like I was completely reconciled in all of my relationships. At least the point where I was aware of relationships in my life. Here's to try. <laughs> That's where I'm at. Again, here's to try. <laughs> Sitting up. At least trying to go over that bar. 
so the ritual uh, emerged out of this community where people lived communally and were sharing food a lot every day. Um, I think the early church was a whole lot like the sick Gurdwara, <laughs> where uh, feeding people was part of the deal, absolutely critical to the uh, to the religion. Sharing a meal, sharing everything. Uh, so you know, people, as the Book of Acts says, they shared from their abundance, and took from their need, and. Uh, it was a household, and this was an extraordinary feature of the early church, uh, because um, uh, society was organized around family. You lived in a family compound with all your extended relatives um, in the Roman Empire, and so the idea of, of creating a, an artificial family, if you will, was very much part of uh, the early churches. What made the early church so distinctive? It was a, uh, a sanctuary, a community of sanctuary for people to, uh, people who are marginalized, um, alienated, uh, in every way. So that could be uh, poverty, but it also could be just feeling uh, uh, apart from the, from the uh, mainstream society at the time. And I think I might have pointed out that there was a lot of uh, just the, the whole uh, uh, level of sexual abuse in the Roman Empire is well documented and pretty horrific. And the early church offered a, uh, an alternative culture for that, uh, for people who wanted to avoid that, that kind of scene and uh, be in an environment where there was uh, uh, a different level of morality. So. The early church was a, a powerfully attractive alternative culture, but very much an alternative culture because of these uh, features. Uh, you know, early on the communities were uh, scattered, disparate, and different, and that's how we have the letters of Paul uh, exhorting these different communities to fall into line and do things in a more standardized way as evidenced in this passage from Corinthians. The New Testament is the beginning of, a, of some development of an orthodoxy, but that took a very long time. And again, there were many manifestations of the faith and of its uh, rituals. Uh, and the, uh, what we know from the Gnostic tradition really brings that to life by all the tremendous variety of ways that, that uh, Christianity was interpreted and expressed and built that. Uh, just on the topic of the Eucharist, you know, the, the, the idea that the, uh, that the elements of bread and wine were the actual body and blood of the Christ. Um, scholars are pretty sure that that idea was written in to the Gospels. Okay, so when Jesus said, this is my body, I'm broken for you, uh, there's agreement among the Jesus scholars, at least, that the biblical scholars who uh, um, are not um, promoting orthodox Christianity, um, but are more you know entirely focused on an academic understanding of early Christianity, they all agree that 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 passage is not or not that, that, that those are not the words of the historical Jesus. Of course, we're back to that issue we discussed before: just who was the historical Jesus? And that's a kind of a fool's errand at some level to. To determine that, but but there's agreement among uh, academic scholars that that passage was written back into the New Testament by the early Christian community as it emerged uh, much later um, than the time of Jesus himself. So this idea of the real presence, as the Catholic Church refers to it, uh, begins to uh, become important early on, but it has different interpretations, as you can see in. The, the Didache has an expression of it that's very different than that one example we got of a, of a Gnostic understanding, which is that uh, that the uh, 
the Eucharist is to be understood in a spiritual sense, ultimately, not in a material sense. Um, that it is a, a ritual which activates a spiritual experience. So it's an important real thing, um, but the nature of the real presence is, you know, the understanding of, of the real presence is very different than what emerged later as Catholic Orthodoxy about the Eucharist. And that's part, that's just one part of why the, the emerging Catholic Church uh, considered the Gnostics to be heretics, because that, that idea of the real presence, the physical presence of God, of Jesus, uh, his actual body and blood and the elements is a very, very central, completely central to Catholic orthodoxy. Um, but that, that the whole concept of the, the Eucharist um, is uh, a real window into early Christianity and also into the history of the church. Um, because it's, uh, it's understood as as a physical reality, a kind of magic, if you will, in which in the Mass, at the ringing of the bell, there's the moment of transubstantiation, in which the bread becomes the body, the, you know, the actual physical body of, of Jesus the Christ. And this becomes his actual blood. And we partake of that physical uh, reality of, uh, of Jesus. And it goes back, but then there, of course, there's mysticism there, of course, right? Uh, and it harks back to St. Paul saying, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. And you make that physical, you make that very real and tangible by taking his elements. Uh, Jesus, the physical person, um, becomes part of you, becomes you, uh, enters you, uh, transforms you. Um, in the later medieval era, uh, this concept uh, gets connected to alchemy, yes? The alchemical tradition, which is the prototype of modern chemistry, but really, at the time, was uh, a, an amalgam, if you will, of, uh, of, of the uh, origin of chemistry with a spiritual understanding of, of matter, right? It's, it's a, uh, a physical process that is done in the interest of a spiritual transformation. The trying to, uh, to get gold out of dross is, is the process of, of uh, refining the soul, ultimately. So in all alchemical literature of the medieval era, um, you have these, the alchemists uh, cooking up, making, you know, doing chemistry, so to speak, bubble, bubble, toil and trouble, and uh, cooking up concoctions and trying to uh, change matter, but it's always understood in the context of a spiritual process as well. Um, and uh, the depth psychologist Carl Jung uh, makes a lot of reference to the alchemical tradition of the medievals, the medievals um, understanding it as a spiritual uh, depth psychological process of, uh, that's very much related to the Gnostic tradition. That's central to the Gnostic tradition that you're, uh, in a way that you're you're uh, you're purifying the soul. You're getting rid of the dross. You're transforming the the base metal into the gold, if you will, uh, through this uh, spiritual progression uh, into the mysteries. So there's always both a physical aspect and a spiritual aspect to the to the. To the communion ritual of the Eucharist. Uh, then you get into the uh, Reformation era, and something shifts. Yes? So you get uh, 
a major radical shift in the understanding, of the understanding about the Eucharist with uh, uh, the radical reformers. So that would be the early, what we would call Presbyterians, Calvin, Zwingli, etc., uh, the Swiss Reformation. And in that uh, understanding, uh, the Eucharist is symbolic, not physical. Yes? Uh, and, and still, this, that, that point of view prevails today in Protestant Christianity. Um, the idea that the bread and the wine are symbolic representations of the presence and the experience of the Christ, and the encounter with Christ. But they are not the actual physical body and blood of Jesus. Uh, there was a, now the, the reformer Martin Luther uh, maintained the Catholic traditional Orthodox approach to the, to the topic. So he believed that the body and the bread were, the body was in the bread and the blood was, was the cup. So he had the Orthodox understanding. And that's still, that theology continues in Lutheran tradition today. Um, uh, the sort of the Eucharistic type churches, the, the higher the high church liturgy of folks within the Protestant tradition have maintained that point of view. Uh, but there was a wonderful debate between Martin Luther and uh, uh, Zwingli, one of the radical reformers in the Swiss Reformation, and, and it was <laughs> a wondrous a wondrous argument that involved a lot of uh, mudslinging and foul language. It's it's pretty wild reading. Uh, there's a lot of you know fury and anger within the Protestant movement about this whole debate about whether or not Jesus was in the elements of the, of the uh, Eucharist. And uh, Zwingli wrote a piece called uh, "A Baked God?" Question <laughs> mark. Can you bake God? Uh, making fun of the idea, uh, making light of the idea of. Uh, of the real presence, and uh, Luther's screed against Spangley is one of the one of the, it's part of the great one of the great parts of uh, you know, that that debate is a great piece of uh, uh, literature in the Christian tradition. It makes for fascinating and fun reading. But there's another level of, of this debate, uh, something behind this debate that I think is a very important thing for understanding this this essential Christian ritual. <clears throat> and that is that at the time of this <clears throat> at the time of the debate between Luther and the radical reformers, that was just right after the invention of the printing press. And we talked about this before, um, that until the, the invention of the printing press, people um, really thought of words as things. Remember we discussed that. <clears throat> the words were actors in the universe. They weren't just symbols, they were real. They were real things. And they went out and did things. And they delivered stuff back to you. Took action. Words were actors in the world. Uh, with the printing press, then you get the ubiquity of the printed word. and. Uh, people begin to shift their understanding of words not, and, and turn them, you know, begin to understand them as symbols that referred to something else that was real. But the words themselves had no reality apart from that to which they referred. This is a real shift in consciousness, if you will, really, in uh, Western civilization and global civilization. Um, and the debate between Luther and Spengli reflects this. This shift holding on to the old idea, Spengli is uh, representing a culture change. Saying that the, these elements are symbolic and the symbols aren't the reality. They're pointers to the reality. Uh, this is associated, of course, with iconoclasm in Radical Reformation Christianity. So, and we talked about iconoclasm before. So you have the, the radical 
the, the churches of the radical reformers were stripped of iconography. Um, because what mattered was the message and not the symbols that referred to the message. Uh, and they didn't want people to worship the symbols because it was they were cutting off uh, any kind of belief in the reality of those symbols, the, the, the presence of the divine in the symbol uh, was uh, considered a heretical idea by, by the radical reformers. So, but, but again, it, re it reflects a culture shift that, that has played out in many, many different ways in our, in our society up to this day. I'll just throw out you know, Jim's opinion. <laughs> I think in a way, where we're at now in Christianity and in the culture out, you know, around and outside of Christianity is that we're trying to get back to a sense of the reality in the symbolic. We're trying to reclaim the real presence of the divine in, uh, in uh, ritual, in symbology, in imagery, and in the natural, physical world around us. Uh, the, the argument between Zwingli and Luther really symbolized a, uh, an alienation that was happening of humanity from the divinity in nature, That's the, 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 the real presence of, of mystery and power and energy in uh, the natural world, including the nature of these elements. So how do we get back to that sense of the numinous, of the real presence of, uh, of the divine in, uh, in the world, in the physical world? And I, I don't think it's going to be the same way of looking and thinking and seeing and feeling that existed before uh, this debate between Zwingli and Luther. Uh, but it, I think it represents, you know, we're, we're going through an era when we're, claiming a new kind of relationship that's, that uh, um, honors the real presence of uh, the sacred in, in everyday life, in the real world around us. It's a new, a new way of doing that that's compatible with science and compatible with uh, common sense, but also uh, compatible with poetry and music and art <coughs> and uh, the depths of our psyche and the depths of our spirit, and the, the heart of religion. So, end of sermon on that. But I think it's just this, this whole, the Eucharist itself, uh, the story of the Eucharist, in a way, is the story of uh, our connection between, uh, uh, the connection or lack thereof between the divine and the physical world around us. Going back a second to the Gnostics themselves, yes. Do the Gnostic worshippers uh, intend to do uh, to undertake this ceremony every week, or do they kind of see it as uh, more of a one-off which you undertake after a long period of contemplation as a culmination? The bar is high, and so do, in the beginning is there a possibility that some might have just undertaken a long period of preparation and then seen this as a way to? You know, I, I don't know quite how to answer that. I think the answer is yes, that there were there, but there was such diversity in the way the ceremony was carried out. But it was a, a pretty ubiquitous ceremony, mm -hmm. very much part of the tradition in the very earliest days. Um, and again, this is partly just an outgrowth of the Passover, the fact that the first, the first, you know, the one in the Gospels was a, was a Passover meal. Mm -hmm. So you have the, the, these Jewish communities scattered around the Roman Empire um, that are conducting Passover, and then Christianity becomes an overlay, or really kind of a sect of Judaism in the Jewish diaspora of the, of the empire. And, uh, and so it's you know, tied to that ritual, which was built around a meal, like a real meal, full-blown dinner. Uh, so the early Christians were having these agape feasts, these full-blown meals, include, that included this ritual, just like the Passover meal does. 
here in the midst of eating a feast, and in the midst of that, there are these aspects of ceremony that go with the, the feast. Uh, so then this becomes uh, built into the idea of Sabbath, mm -hmm. um, uh, the Jewish concept of the Sabbath, which then becomes the time of Christian liturgy, the repetition of this, this meal and this feast every week. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but again, you know, there's so many different versions of it, different words of institution, you know, different meanings really that we're given to, to the ceremony. Any questions or thoughts about this, or reactions to this? Uh, any thoughts on my thesis, whether that makes any sense or not? But <laughs> Something I thought about a lot. That was an old conversation. Uh, folks like uh, Reverend Michael Dowd yes. uh, seem to be uh, at the forefront of this renegotiation in the way the divine is thought to participate in the physical world, as it were. This is to do with the uh, so called uh, evolution and intelligent design debate, where Reverend Dowd has this very different way of looking at evolution as a manifestation of something more transcendental than is commonly understood in the textbook sense. Yes. I don't know if that any sense. But. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, what Michael's doing is, is uh, what he, he's popularizing process theology. Uh, and, and I don't know if I've talked much about that. Have I talked about that at all here? With you? There's a process of God you mentioned in your work. Yeah, I, I mentioned that as one of the, yeah, I gave a little short spiel on what process thought is. But the gist of it, it's a, a, a school of thought that came uh, as a consequence of the uh, philosophical work of Alfred North Whitehead, who is a math, very famous mathematician. Uh, Whitehead and, uh, um, come on now, Russell. Russell and Whitehead wrote Principia Mathematica. Uh, the idea of that book was, it was like, the, they, they, these two thought they had figured out all of math, they, that they had the structure for the whole puppy, right? Uh, so it's a, a grand uh, work of, of uh, mathematics, a, systema, a, systema, a systematization of all of mathematics at the time. So this is the early, you know, late 19th century, early 20th century. So he was very famous as a mathematician and a philosopher, but he had a very strong interest in theology. And uh, his, his quest with philosophy was to uh, bridge the gap between philosophy and quantum mechanics. Because uh, he could see that quantum mechanics posed a, a radical challenge to, to the philosophical tradition. And uh, it really required a different formulation, big time. And so he came up with this idea of process, uh, which he, as a person of, uh, of deep faith and uh, in a world strong spiritual and religious interest, he also saw he saw quantum mechanics as a challenge to traditional theology as well. And so he was trying to bridge all three in his work. Um, the book I would recommend the most uh, as a kind of primer uh, you know, for him is uh, Religion in the Making by Whitehead. It's, uh, I think it was his Gifford Lectures, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Anyway, it was a great intro to his thought around process uh, philosophy as it applied to, to religion and theology. And the gist of his idea is that uh, God is not supernatural. Uh, he, he's what we would call a panentheist, and I talked about that, the varieties of God are. Um, so that God, God is a, a quality of the cosmos or a, 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 an essential, the, the, the God is the, is the creative principle and the creative uh, essence of the cosmos. Um, process thought is, is uh, connected again to uh, quantum mechanics around the idea that every, everything in the cosmos, every entity or, or event, which is a very, on the mechanical term, every event 
has an element of freedom and choice and creativity. Um, that every event, and this is a, a feature of quantum mechanics, right? It's like you're, you're talking about probabilities, not about uh, certain outcomes, right? Uh, you're talking about um, statistical likelihood of events as opposed to certainty of events. And so Whitehead interpret that, interprets that philosophically as a kind of uh, free will, if you will. But now that's a whole longer discussion about free will that would take us days to discuss. <laughs> but it's a, a, it, it could be described as free will. And you might say then that uh, a, a subatomic particle, a boson, has a choice about which way to spin left or right, up or down, right? Um, because it's not determinate. So there's this element of looseness and possibility and potential for change and creativity in everything, every event in the cosmos, in, the his, in, in natural history. Um, and that God, then, is this principle of possibility. God is creativity, in a word, the process by which um, choice happens. And that this is the nature, that God is the nature of, of nature, the creative principle of nature. Now what this suggests is, of course, that God is not omnipotent, omniscient, any of that. God is not because, and that, that goes with indeterminacy, right? Um, God is the process by which reality comes into being. Uh, that the reality is not fixed, it's not known by God. God is woven as the essence of reality itself, Orthodox Christian theism. Um, so, one of the aspects of panentheism and of process, philosophy and theology, is its uh, embrace of the divinity, the divine nature of, of uh, what we think of as physical reality, that uh, God is in um, everything, every event, expressed, God is expressed through the creative potential of every entity. In the, in the cosmos. So there's a divinity woven into reality, the physical, including the bread and the wine. So it's a way of re-hallowing the world, uh, this, this uh, philosophy, this, this spirituality that comes out of this point of view. Uh, it's different than the one that existed in the first century that looked at the real presence as the body and blood and, and part of the wine. But it uh, certainly gets back to that spirit. Does that help? Any more questions about that? Um, but yeah, I'm straight far from the early church, but I think it just, it just the reason I'm bringing up this trajectory and the, the, the way that uh, that these ideas weave into Christian history throughout throughout the 2,000 years of, of, of the faith. Because um, I think history's not dead. <laughs> it's alive. It's alive. And this, this whole discussion goes on, you know, that there's a, um, about the nature of the elements. It continues. Uh, uh, takes many forms still to this day in Christianity, beyond what I've just told you about. But, you know, the sects of the church have many different viewpoints about, about the elements. Um, in, the er in the early church, one strand of the Gnostic tradition used, wa uh, used water instead of wine for the, uh, for the ritual. Uh, because, partly because that branch of the church was uh, 
against it was against drinking alcohol because they wanted to reach the spirit without spirits. <laughs> was, you know, part of the mystery, you know, to, to, to rise up to that higher level of knowledge and, and uh, oneness with the pleroma, the ultimate reality of God, you had to be sober in order to get that level of spirit. So that was part of the reason. But another part of it is the connection to the ritual of baptism and, uh, and the whole concept of, of cleansing, uh, which is woven into so many of the traditions, both Catholic and non-Catholic. You approach the sacred meal uh, uh, with good intentions. You approach it with a... Uh, you show up clean for this event, for this uh, ritual. Um, there's a, a purging of, of bad intentions and uh, uh, a need to reconcile with other people and with God in order to partake in this, this meal. Whether you look at it as symbol or as physical reality, either way, it seems that across the board Christians have always had this, this point of view that the meal is not to be taken lightly. It's something to be uh, approached with uh, reverence. As clean, a, as clean a slate as you can bring to it. So. Uh, but yeah, back to the early church. So this, you know, the, the Eucharist is sort of a window into all the uh, varied ways that the uh, early community of the, of the faith uh, developed. Um, but you start, you know, you start out with a pretty flat, you know, hierarchy in, in the church, uh, relatively flat, where there's a great intimacy between the leaders and the, and the people, and there's some level of even democracy in some cases in the, the choosing of leaders. Sometimes, well, in the, in the Gnostic tradition, very often the, the uh, uh, Liturgists were chosen by lot, uh, drawing straws or sticks, if you will, to decide who would do it. Uh, that's still how it's done in the Amish tradition. Amazingly, they uh, essentially draw straws to figure out who's going to lead worship, when, and they move it around between. The Amish people don't have sanctuaries; they, they uh, worship in people's houses. And um, yeah, the, the uh, preacher was chosen by a random. Uh, so yeah, in a sense, the Amish way is is really quite close to uh, to how, how certain aspects of the, of the earliest Christian communities function. You begin to see uh, as the church grows, as it spreads, as it begins to develop an orthodoxy. And as communities become more uh, institutionalized, uh, and there's more acceptance by the Roman Empire of, of, of the Christian community, then you start seeing more of a hierarchy, more of a distance socially between the leadership and the people. Uh, you begin to have a very stylized ritual. Um, you begin to have, instead of a meal around a table, Passover style, you start having an altar and the priest facing the altar and facing the back wall of the church instead of facing the people. Uh, and it ceases to be a communal meal and it becomes a, very much a liturgy of a, of a ritual. Um, a ritual that's done in the name of everybody, right? But without a whole lot of audience participation, right? Uh, so it has it becomes a kind of a, almost like a magic that's uh, performed on behalf of the, for the well-being of the whole community. Um, and, that, and that prevails in Catholicism all the way up until very recently, when you have uh, the Second Vatican Council in the early 1960s, when the tables get turned. That was radical. I mean, I don't think people today really understand what a big deal that was for the Church to start having the the priest face the people. So there's the priest, there's the table, and there's the people. So that's a, a ritual symbolism of 
back to being around a table together, sharing a meal, at least ritually. Uh, so yeah, we have, there's always been a, uh, uh, elements of, of Christian community throughout the history of the church that hark back to the early church way of living. And uh, a nostalgia for that, which during the Reformation really gets going. Uh, and this gets back to the whole idea of, of uh, uh, the relationship to words. Again, you had uh, the early church had scriptures, it had, had uh, uh, important writings. Uh, they did not, again, you know, the history of the Bible, we talked about that. Um, so the early church did not think of the writings of Paul or the Gospels to be scripture at first. That, that idea emerged much later uh, with the development of the canon of scripture. Um, so there's this idea that there's the, the sacredness about the, you know, that the idea of Jewish scriptures is carried over into Christianity and eventually applied to the Christian writings, the, the sacredness of the text. But the church, the early church, and even the Catholic church, um, the authority of the church was the Christian community and its leaders, not the Bible. And that's important to understand about early Christianity. The authority was the bishop. Um, as a representative of the Christian community. And the bishop and uh, the other leaders and the elders of the church interpreted the Bible to the people, right? So the authority is not the Christian writings, it's not the emerging Bible. Uh, the Bible is authoritative, but it is not the authority for Christianity. Then you get the printing press, you get the ubiquity of printed Bibles. You have the ability of the common person to own a Bible unheard of before uh, the 15th century, 16th century. Just not happening. People didn't have Bibles. They were rare and precious hand transcribed books. So it's then that you get this idea of, of the uh, authority of the Bible being primary, as opposed to the authority of the, the bishops, of the, of the priesthood, of the church itself. Um, and we still have that idea to this day that has become pretty ubiquitous in Christianity, including within the Catholic Church. Uh, this idea from Protestantism of the authority of the Bible, the absolute authority of the scripture, has seeped down a lot into Catholicism uh, into the Catholic tradition. Uh, it's not the dominant point of view, but I'm saying among lay people in the Catholic Church, there's a, a greater reverence, if you will, for the Scripture as, as the source of authority for a Christian living. But that was not the case in the, in the early days of the Church. Uh, that's just something to, to understand. Um, so a lot of a lot of uh, uh, modern manifestations of Christianity that claim to be living the early church way. Uh, also, most of them, most of those manifestations of, of trying to do Christianity early, early church style um, are uh, biblically based uh, in terms of their source of authority. But that's not the case, that was not the case for the early church. That's a, it's an irony. Basically, you've got a person in, interpreting, yes, writing it down, right, and now what they've written down is authoritative. Suddenly, become authoritative. And, and, you know, Saint Paul did not have that in mind at all. He wrote, you know, he's trying to bring order to this. He's trying to herd the guppies. You know, he's trying to herd the cats. Uh, but if you really read the New Testament, if you read those letters, you realize they were a bunch of guppies. You know, they were flying all different directions and doing things different ways. And he was trying to whip them into shape his way. And, and he, uh, the he had a hard time. churches that I've attended, and I've been to quite a few of them, all have one thing in common. 
they all interpret the, as they call him, the Apostle Paul and his writings as the finite and absolute truth. And if you were to talk to most of these folks about this, they would argue you, argue you down by pulling out scriptures and argue with you as if no matter what you say, no matter what facts you bring to the case, whatever is in that book, in that literal interpretation that they've interpreted, is exactly the way it was supposed to be. And, and, and in fact, I, I, my last church was in what they call apologetics ministry. And in this particular ministry, um, they go by the, the thought process that the Apostle Paul got this great message or change when Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus. And from that story, which is a beautiful story to read about, we don't know if it really happened, right? But they base everything in this church and will argue with you about every point just off of that one story and that one uh, meeting that they that possibly took place. And they believe in this mysticism that have existed supposedly 2,000 years ago, but obviously can't, none of this mysticism can exist in today's time. They won't believe in any other mysticism, but they definitely believe Except for that, yeah. So I, that's where yeah. the churches I came from. But it, I think, you know, it, it, it's, uh, again, instructive to read St. Paul, to read these letters, and get a feel for the diversity. Of the churches, and and for the uh, um, heterodoxy of Christianity at the time, and this was just you know what we read in the New Testament is just the tip of the iceberg of that heterodoxy. There was there was a whole lot more diversity than, than what we what we read in the canonical scriptures, uh, as revealed by uh, the church fathers and their descriptions of these quote-unquote, heretical churches. Uh, so, the fabulous diversity of Christianity today is just, in a way, kind of a mirror image of how it was then. You know, this fantastic, bewildering array of, of sectarian manifestations of Christianity is just a, you know, just a, uh, you know, a, a larger fractal image of what what we had then, in terms of diversity. It's old news, in other words. And, uh, and that, I think, is in a way kind of, kind of uh, reassuring. <laughs> it's, maybe we could calm down about, you know, I think those of us who, uh, you know, those Christians who get tempted to say there's, there's got to be only one way to do this, you know, and, and uh, get angsty about that, you know, Look at the history. Look at the history of the church. Look at the beginnings of the church. And maybe it's an opportunity to kind of relax about this a bit and just be aware of how, how diverse it was. And, it, and somehow this fractious, divided, messy thing has survived for 2,000 years. And that's kind of a miracle. It's amazing. Let me um, ask you this. Did yes. the other strains outside of the early orthodoxy also think that they were right and oh, the orthodoxy absolutely. was wrong? Oh, totally. Oh, yeah. There were major arguments about this. Big so, battles. So they claim it wasn't just the Catholic Church that claimed ex exclusivist, oh, no, no, correct no. interpretation. Everybody did. Oh, oh, lots. Not everybody, maybe. But I think there was a lot of tolerance. Within the Gnostic movement, there was a certain amount of toleration for other manifestations of Christianity. Uh, which is one of the things that the early church fathers hated about it. So they, they, they let you do whatever, you know? Right. They, they, they're, they're cool with other churches doing their own thing. You know, that's wrong. <laughs> and that was part of their complaint against it. Now, at the end of this, of the wonderful book, The Gnostic Gospels by Elaine Pagels, uh, Princeton uh, religion professor who, who wrote this beautiful book about the early church, uh, she poses a question that still haunts me 30-some years after reading this book for the first time. And it's a really very interesting question. She says, um, could 
Christianity as a religion have survived to this day if the Gnostics had not been had, had not been squelched by the emerging Catholic Church. Mm. <laughs> In other words, could Christianity have had the staying power to live through persecutions and confusions and wars and all the messes of history for 2,000 years? Could it have continued without having the kind of rigid uh, um, structure the hierarchy that emerged in, in the Catholic Church. Could it have delivered the faith for 2,000 years? She didn't answer the question. She just leaves it hanging out there. And it's a really interesting question. Something for you to ponder. Um, any thoughts on that? What My do you initial think? reaction is no, no way. If you yeah. think about how authoritative yeah. the Catholic Church was in its imperialism. Yeah. I mean, it's simply in terms of recruitment and maintaining numbers in the movement. I mean, the forced conversion of the entire New World seems to be relevant, for example. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> On the other I think hand, that's a relevant thing. Yeah. On the other hand, just as a counterpoint, if we think of some of the Oriental faiths which are not typically yes. viewed as organized religions, yes. they seem to have done fine in terms of the numbers. Hinduism. Yeah, yeah there's sustained no orthodoxy there. Faithful. Yeah, there isn't any enforced top-down orthodoxy, yes, though there are different strains of orthodoxy. But absence of central authority hasn't led to its extinction in any way. Uh -huh. Judaism mm -hmm. also is a great, I mean, of course, they got pretty well wiped out, and, you know, over and over again. But, you know, Judaism, same thing. Mm -hmm. There's no central orthodoxy, there's no church. Yeah, and then come through way worse than Christianity. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and, and there's no expectation. There's no, I think throughout uh, many of the strands, if not all, you know, not all, but many of the strands of Christianity, Protestant, Catholic, Anabaptist, everything else, there's this idea that, you know, we're the true faith. There's got to be a true faith. There's got to be a, the right version of this. But in Judaism, people just, you know, no. I don't care, <laughs> you know. Uh, some people care a bit more than others, but you know, generally not. And in Hinduism, th same thing. There's just a complete openness to heterodox. Um, but it's just very interesting. You know, it's still, I, I'm still haunted by that question. I don't know that there's a tidy answer to it, at least for for the Christian faith. Um, so we'll let that dangle for the end of class today, and also let. Let it hang out there. What is this that we're looking at? What is it? And what to what does it point? But also, uh, what is actually in these elements? What's in there? Is God in them? Can you, in fact, bake God? Maybe so. Till next time. Okay.